Matthew Ibrahim, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Erica, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you being here and you're about to do a deep dive on deceleration, agility, change of direction. And I'm really excited to learn myself selfishly, (laughs) but a lot of my listeners really want to learn how to be better at pumping the brakes, be better at being more agile and being a step ahead of their opponent. So this is going to be such a great discussion. I have so many questions. I know you have a lot to share. But before we get into that, just give a background on who you are and who you work with today. Anytime I get this question, I always have a million thoughts running through my mind. And I'm like, the easiest one to say is that I'm a coach. And so I was originally a full-time strength coach for 15 years. I still coach in a part-time, shorter role in my 16th year now. But I think the way that I like to view everything is that whether I'm teaching students in a classroom, whether I'm traveling, guest lecturing, whether I'm coaching athletes in the weight room, whether I'm mentoring my students at APU, I'm coaching, I'm educating, I'm instructing, I'm teaching them. So that's kind of my my umbrella term. But what I technically do, so in the office I'm in now, I work here at Endicott College. It's a it's a small town in the, in the North Shore in Massachusetts. You can just say it's in Boston. So I'm the clinical coordinator or internship coordinator of all exercise science students looking to do internships in the field. Uh, we require three internships, so freshman, sophomore, and senior year in a nutshell. So helping them find internships in s and PT, other exercise science fields as well. That's my full-time role. I also teach as an instructor and faculty in the department, academic advising. This is, this is my nine to five. Outside of that, uh, I run a mentorship program in the fall, spring, and summer semesters called Athletic Performance University. We, you know, we meet over an eight-week period. It's very much like an undergraduate course um, with NSCCUs. I'm fortunate to be able to travel and provide lectures and seminars and whatnot on a very, very smaller scale now because of uh, the full-time role. And then I volunteer as a coach here on campus with, with our Division Three athletes. Um, right now, it's with a football team. I consult and work with the women's basketball team as well from an assessment standpoint and program design standpoint. That's awesome. So it sounds like I have another pracademic on my <laughs> show. So combining the research side, the academic side, but then also still working with athletes in a practical setting. So I love this. This is going to be great. Let's get into deceleration first. So maybe we can just start off by defining what deceleration is and then just build from there. Yeah, the way that I simplify it is like imagine you're driving a car, right? You have the people. So scenario one, right? Someone is just speeding. They're always driving fast. They're like, yeah, there's a 30 mile per hour thickly settled district, uh, district sign. I'm going to blow that off and just keep revving the engine. And then they come to an abrupt halt, right? That would be a very inefficient pair of brakes. Whereas if you're driving slow, you're sort of peppering the brakes, you, you, you slow down about you know, 20 feet behind the car in front of you, you're very risk averse. That's a really efficient pair of brakes. So to me, that's how I just simplify deceleration. But, uh, but I think what happens is, Erica, is we, we have to appreciate force application first and foremost. Everyone wants to produce force, right? Rate of force development, force production, power, strength, speed. That's awesome. That is incredible. But the other side of the coin is force absorption and how do we self-organize? How do we orient our bodies in chaotic, violent, fast situations in sport to change directions and be agile? So for me, deceleration in a very simple way of understanding is slowing down, pumping the brakes, absorbing force and accepting load and impact. So what are some ways to build this ability? Like where would you start with someone? So let's say we would say, hey, Eric, I want to help you sprint. And you're brand new to training and exercise. You've never exercised in your life. I wouldn't just have you sprint. I would say, hey, like, let's crawl first, then learn how to walk, then learn how to jog, and then learn how to run, and then learn how to sprint. It's a very systematic, uh, methodical approach, right? This is, we all agree with this. I think no one would disagree with that approach. However, when it comes to deceleration, Something as simple as most people call it a snap down. Some people call it a a drop squat. Essentially, you're in a squat position. You reach up for the imaginary rebound. You do a heel raise and you snap down really quickly. That's a very common exercise as a basic level one teaching tool. I liken that to I'm I'm going to do a TRX hand assisted squat for someone who doesn't know how to squat and orient their hips, their knees, their ankles, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, the keyboard tough guys and tough gals and or the social media like uh, warriors, they want to th- – the biggest misconception is a lot of people will sort of poo-poo on that and say, well, that's not going to help them prepare for aggressive, violent – mannered situations at fast speeds at high velocities in sports at like super aggressive ang- angles and, and, and utilizing different shapes of your body. I would fully agree with that totally, but you have to start somewhere. So where do you start, right? You can't just throw some to the wolves and say, Hey, I want you to sprint really fast and then stop on a dime. Well, I've never trained before. So where do I begin? Obviously, if I have someone like LeBron James or Leo Messi or Serena Williams start with snap downs, it might to some seem laughable because they're high level athletes, right? But if I have a 12 year youth athletic development uh, athlete who plays, let's say soccer, I know that's your, that's your jam. My jam's basketball, but we can meet in the middle, right? I'm, I'm gonna, I need to start them somewhere. So for me, it's, I think we need to appreciate uh, motor control coordination uh, and then how, how individuals learn over time. Think of like uh, motor learning theory principles, right? That's really important to, to to take in. And most people just completely blow that off and just, you know, want to be keyboard tough guys and social media warriors. We need athletes to begin somewhere. We need to give them progressions, regressions, lateralizations to have something to work from. If something's easy, immediately advance, but have them be proficient in those skills first and then advance. And that, that, that's, a, that's a key thing as well. Like soccer, I'm going to pass the ball. I'm going to shoot the ball. I'm going to I'm going to run, I'm going to score, I'm going to play defense, whatever. I'm going to head the ball. Like I played soccer as well, so I understand there's different skills involved with that. The weight room for S&C, these are skills that we can help athletes utilize and become awesome at so they're awesome at their sport. So we have to start somewhere. Don't throw them in the wolves. Start simple with snap downs or drop squats. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've seen a lot on Twitter, a lot of hate <laughs> on the snap down. I think someone the other week tweeted, the worst exercise ever invented is the snap down. And it's like, well, we kind of have to start at a foundational level, especially like you said, for a, an athlete going through their growth spurt, who's never done any sort of formal deceleration work in a controlled setting. And that's one thing I really want to touch on is like, why is that snap down so important so that athletes can get to the next step? And what are some of those advanced exercises that eventually they'll progress to because they're not going to be doing mm-hmm. snap downs all the time. That would be stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, no, I agree. So the way that, the way that I conceptualize it is, okay, so what, what is a snap down, right? Before that, we have to control eccentrics. So can you control your body in space? That to me is an athlete. Every human being is an athlete. If you can control your body in space, awesome. That checks off the box for strength, power, speed, et cetera, et cetera. So isometrics, eccentrics, and then rapid eccentrics or eccentric rate of force development. Essentially, a snap down is a fast eccentric. You're coming down really fast and you have to come to an abrupt halt. That's a squat position. So sagittal plane, we break it down by planes. To me, it's easier to master sagittal and frontal plane and then work in transverse planes. Sport occurs in tra- transverse plane, rotational, multi-directional, multi-planar demands. We have to start somewhere. So for me, the basic, basic, basics are do a bilateral uh, sagittal plane, your squat position, snap down or drop squat. Great. Body weight is easy. Awesome. Overload that. You can use anything you want as a strength coach, as a tool. Resistance band, weight vest, medicine ball, dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever. Add external load to make it more challenging, increase intensity, decrease volume, inverse relationship. When that becomes easy, the obvious applies. Bilateral, go to sort of or pseudo unilateral. Maybe you're in a kickstand. Maybe you go into a reverse lunge. Still too easy? Go to a single leg, like a like a drop skater squat or a drop pistol, not drop pistol, drop skater squat or, you know, two to one. And then do a pure unilateral. We just use that same approach. Extremely basic, extremely simple, nothing sexy. Then we go to frontal plane. This one gets really awkward because you're asking someone to drop into a lateral squat rapidly when most people don't lateral squat in and of itself. So I think really teaching, it's the same principles, right? Can you control a rapid eccentric into the bottom position of a lateral squat? Great. That becomes easy. Then you do a lateral lunge. It's more dynamic. Then you do a skater hop which or hiding hop. Everyone does these. Then, that, then like, oh, I get it now. That makes sense. And then maybe you add some sort of overload with, like I said, bands, medicine balls. You can even make it more chaotic with adding a medicine ball rapid chop 
or a chop and lift, or again, be creative. Like there's no rules as long as you have the principles of going, so staying in one of those planes, going from bilateral to sort of or pseudo unilateral to pure unilateral. Once you've done those two, I think it becomes much easier to then do change of direction drills, which we know the research talks about being rehearsed, planned, instructed. So Eric, I'm going to have you do a T-test, okay? We're going to run from cone A to cone uh, B, 10 yards, lateral shuffle left, lateral shuffle right, and then back pedal, so on and so forth. I'm telling you, it's planned or pre-planned and it's rehearsed. You as the athlete, Erica, know exactly what you're doing. Sure, do you have to demonstrate the ability to be agile in tight spaces? Absolutely. However, change of direction is easier from a modal learning theory standpoint. There's less thought process needed from a cognitive ability standpoint. When we advance to agility, by definition, it needs a reactive component, a la, or, or, or I'm sorry, via some sort of external stimuli. So if I, we're playing dodgeball, we're playing dodgeball, Eric, okay? So I throw the ball, you have to, you, maybe you shuffle left and you react to that stimulus to get out of the way. That, to, that, that is by definition in the literature, agility, because it has a reactive component. It is not pre-planned, it is not rehearsed. So that's how I would program in a, in, in a very blanket statement in a nutshell. This could take up to six to 12 months. Isometrics for tendon health, eccentrics for continued tendon health, rapid eccentrics or decel ability, change of direction, and then agility. Is there going to be overlap? For sure. But that's, how, that's kind of my, my big 10,000 foot view bird's eye approach to, to the program design for this. I like that. It's a it's a really nice blend of both sides of all of this. I think people tend to just be too much on the okay, we need perfect mechanic side in the controlled setting or no, they don't need mechanics at all. We just need to like play fun games. And it's like, well, can't we just come in the middle here and do both? And I'm really intrigued by the research on really building eccentric strength in a controlled setting to really improve change of direction. So do you just want to expand on that so people understand why we need to build that in the gym and mm -hmm. to like actually focus on our mechanics at times? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> do you mind if I share screen? Oh yeah, you should be good to go. Yep. Sweet, sweet. So I have a full presentation, which is way too many slides to share screen. It's over like 250. I'm not going to share that. There's <laughs> a couple of key points that I want to look at when it comes to this. So this is, this is, uh, this is from uh, the summer, this past summer, we perform better. I think we need to appreciate a few things. So for number one, think of these angles, no volume, so we're good. But I just want you to focus on the different angles that are, occur in sports. So he's going to do a slow-mo. I forget this guy's name. I probably should remember it. I played this video way too many times, but I, for some reason I forget it. He's a great tennis player, but watch the, look at these deep, deep angles for the hip knee. I mean, that is ankle, that is aggressive, right? These occur in sports all of the time, naturally. Then we look at something as simple as speed in sports. I think we all remember this. DK Metcalf chases down Buda Baker, like in a crazy feat of, of speed. There's DK right here, and he's just trucking. He's just absolutely trucking, and he catches him. Right? So this is a, a, a beautiful display of speed in sport. Buda Baker's like, who is that guy? <laughs> Where did he come from? Then we look at something like direction changes. So uh, she's a point. Erica Wheeler is awesome. Um, she completely cuts up the Hall of Fame Sue Bird now, but great crossover, great, great J. But boom, right? Simple, fast, rapid change in direction. Then we look at something simple as collisions, right? The GOAT, he's above me as well. Um, right here, jams that I believe Patrick Ewing, yep, right in the face, boom, right there. So the collisions in sport, these occur all of the time. This is just a normal play in sport. But I think we take these things for granted. The last one is just a so full display of all of these things, direction changes, high speeds, collisions, angles, change of direction, all this type of things, agility. This is when Leo Messi scored to, by most physicists, it's like an impossible goal, like how it got in the net. He completely crosses over the entire team. I don't know how he did this. He's just amazing. Um, I know you can appreciate this, right? Like, how did he get that? How did he get that in? I have no clue. <laughs> like, I remember watching Messi when he wore number 30 and when Ronaldinho was on, was on Barca as well. That's how much I love uh, soccer. So that, to me, I think we have to appreciate all of those plays. And someone might say, well, how is a, how is a drop squad or how is a snap down important? They start somewhere, right? They have to start somewhere. <laughs> so I think that's the most important thing is appreciate all that. In, in a more of a verbal sense, sports require so high speed, there's a level of physicality. 
aggressive, violent manner. There's collision, there's rapid direction changes. And this is a great a line from a recent article in the research last year from McBurney et al. Do not speed up what an athlete cannot slow down. And I think that right there is like, like that emoji, like, poof. it's like, all right, great. And then I remember I was on uh, a Perform Better uh, like webinar series with Lee Taft, Mike Boyle. For some reason, they had me on as well. I have no clue how I was on with them. And Mike was talking about, and I, and I love Mike. I interned for Mike uh, about 13 years ago. I'm, you know, we sent a lot of interns there. I respect a lot what Mike does. Obviously, Lee as well. And Mike, Mike was saying, hey, we don't, we don't have any specific D-cell drills at our facility, but whenever we do our sprints or our pogos, I'm sorry, or our hurdles, we emphasize sticks or slowing down. Or like, let's say you're doing a 20-yard sprint, and then you have to slow down because the end of the turf is there. So it's almost like built in. So what I'm not telling people, hey, take all your plyos and force production stuff and throw it out the window. <laughs> no, I'm saying D-cell and force absorption, they're in the same bucket. Because people say, well, where do I put this in my program design? Well, I'm like, well, where do you put your jumping? Like, great, put it in the same place. It's it's literally the other side of the coin. So I think, you know, you can even be more efficient. Well, hey, maybe you're doing hurdles. How would you progress a hurdle hop, right? You would do a hurdle to stick, a hurdle with a pulse and stick, and then a continuous hurdle. Like that to me, that's a very rudimentary, basic way of doing it. I know, I know Altus ascribes to that. I know Exos ascribes to that. Boyles does. All, all the big names in the field. And my thought process is like, it's already in what we do. Let's just make sure we're doing it all of the time. That's really interesting. And, you know, th there's a lot that goes into all of this. And I get a lot of questions from new soccer clients. Hey, I want to improve my change of direction. And they're expecting it to come in just a few weeks. But it's like, mm -hmm. no, we got to start at the basics and then slowly build up and make sure you can master these motor skills and then we can load and then we can maybe do our depth jumps and our single leg jumps and all that. So my question is, what is a realistic timeline for an athlete to see improvements in mm -hmm. deceleration and change of direction? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm going to jump off screen share. Okay. Um, so I think, I think the context always needs to be, okay, who is the person? What's the age? What's their What's their training age? Not chronological, but let's just, I'll play it out in, in uh, two different formats. If I am brand new, a green athlete, a blank white canvas, I have never trained in my entire life. I would, I would probably start you block one or phase one, which is we all have, the, you know, we all disagree, right? Somewhere between three to six weeks. I'll call it a four week training block. I'm probably going to put a lot of isometrics in there, like for lower body tendon health. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the big five, right? The ankle region knee region, groin region, hip flexor region, and the obvious hamstring region. I say regions because there's tendons, muscles, and structures there. I want to appreciate all those elements. So I'm a big fan of direct and isolated loading in those regions. Think like Nordics, think like Copenhagen variations, uh, calf raises. I'm a big calf guy. I have to bring it up. Hip flexor stuff, groin, um, what did I miss? Uh, knee stuff, like, like knee isometrics, like wall sits, whatnot. I'm a big fan of isometrics first and foremost, yielding isometrics if it's a brand new athlete and client. Why? Because teach them to own positions, right? We also know tendons really love HSR in the research, heavy, slow resistance. So teach the ability to load into the positions and load those joints and tendons. A good dose of isometrics in, in conjunction with Erica, your, your squats, your split squats, your lunges, your deadlifts, like all that great stuff. Bench press, pull-ups, yada, yada, push um, push-ups as well. Throw in some eccentrics in there as well. So same same uh, tissues and structures, same movements. Throw some eccentrics in, three to five second lowers, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe I'm also doing in that block one or phase one, some level of sagittal plane and frontal plane, lower body um, decel drills. So drop squats, you know, drop reverse lunges, drop lateral squats, drop lateral lunges. If it's too easy, add a medicine ball, add a band, yada, yada, yada. Maybe that's phase one. Phase two, advance those drills get into more of the power and uh, strength and power and then continue those. And then maybe phase three is when I get to higher velocity stuff, more rapid stuff, rapid eccentrics, but also some change of direction, instructed, guided, pre-planned drills, phase three slash four, continue advancing those, but also get into some agility reactionary components. That's just general off the cuff. So I would say eight to 12 weeks, three, two to three phases. Right. Is that going to be for everyone? No. But if it's someone who's brand new, 
that's probably a, a very sound, safe, and logical approach. Could someone get there quicker? Sure. You as the coach can make that decision on the floor. Is someone slowing down because they're not coordinated? They don't have they don't have the motor control and the cognitive ability to catch up yet, like the neuromuscular efficiency. Maybe you back off and take a little longer. This is also why, for example, when you think about ladders, right? A lot of people, oh, ladders suck, they're not good. It's like, well, what's the application? If you're if you're having Tyreek Hill, <laughs> obviously a phenomenal NFL wide receiver, use ladders for fast feet. Maybe not a great idea because he's already elite and elusive. Someone who's brand new to training, it might help them coordinate and put their feet in right spots and or and you know dissociate the hips and understand where they need to be in, in space. Like that, that could be change of direction, a very very uh, easy approach. And then you obviously expand to like yardage. When it comes to a high level athlete, let's just use Tyree Kill for example. I mean, he's obviously extremely fast. Like there's no doubt about his speed and acceleration, his velocity. He's just a freak of nature. He's going to be someone who you, you, you're going to have to ramp stuff up with. That's where you can do some trap bar eccentric rapid drop, uh, drops. So think, some, think of a trap bar deadlift, for example, right? Maybe you load it up with 20, 30, 40% of your one rep max, and you're standing up tall, and you drop rapidly down, so rapid eccentric, into a catch position where the, the, the plates never hit the floor. Maybe you do barbell back uh, rapid drop squats as well. Again, 20, 30, 40% one rep max. You don't want to go too heavy, right? Because the goal is eccentric overload. Maybe you do, I'm a big fan. Uh, he's out in uh, Florida. I forget the name of the, the school. Um, Joey, well, I, I'm, I'm going to butcher his last name, so I'm not, I'm not going to say. He's in Florida, he's a strength coach. He has a sweet goatee. He does a lot of the, the drops with uh, heavy loads, heavy dumbbells. So like, think of a drop squat. Think of a drop kickstand squat. Think of a drop reverse lunge, a drop skater squat with heavy dumbbells, so like 30-pound dumbbells in both hands, 40, 50-pound dumbbells. Something where it's going to provide a rapid eccentric a rate of force development, but also eccentric overload to then have that transfer to sport. I know the age-old argument. Erica, you know, the coach says to Erica, hey, Erica, you're never going to emulate or mimic the speed, velocity, and aggression and violence of, of the movement that occurs in sport. I agree. You're never going to mimic that in the weight room. I agree totally. But you can do a pretty damn good job if you build up to as close as you can, right? Max out those qualities in the weight room as best as you can to then when they're, when they're on the field, they're pretty damn prepared to, 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 to play sport and be the athlete. So I'm going to get a little bit deeper into the weeds here. This is another <laughs> big argument that's going on on social media. So in terms of quote unquote, perfect deceleration mechanics, do they exist or should our focus be more on building that eccentric strength? Meaning if an athlete's doing like a pistol, a slow pistol squat in the weight room, but you see a little bit of like knee valgus, so everyone freaks out. <laughs> is that a problem? It's a great question. I think the problem is when we as coaches, practitioners, professionals in the field try to fix and correct everything, right? You saw the angle of that tennis player who, for some reason, I can't think of his name. Joe jo Dubik. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. And Talk that's the that picture down. everyone shares when they make this argument. They're like, well, look at his knee valgus. It is not perfect at all. <laughs> so the, the caveat there is that is it Djokovic? Djokovic, yeah. Djokovic, he didn't just do that out of the blue. He's probably had a thousand, ten thousand reps of being in that position. But I promise you he has some sort of strength coach or physiotherapist strengthening his groin, strengthening the, the lower body, right? He's preparing for that rotational demands, those like rapid eccentrics, right? So I think we have to really appreciate context. We can't chase perfection, right? It's impossible. Everyone moves different. Everyone has different anatomy. Everyone, you know, displays their ability a little bit differently. My big thing, and I know this is so hard for people to comprehend, it's like, does it pass the eye test, right? Let me give you an example. If, if someone's doing a one rep max barbell back squat, so think like powerlifting, right? Like max strength. And they get the weight up, right? And their technique is, you're expecting their technique not to be perfect. Like you're asking them to lift the 100% of their effort. Technique's not going to be perfect. It's not. You look at any powerlifting competition, deadlift, squat, bench press, it's, it's, 
pretty darn close. It's pretty, it's brute force and power and strength, but it's not perfect technique, right? When we, that, that's the, more, the highest risk situation though, right? Now completely flip the coin. If I have someone doing a body weight squat, there's a really good chance technique is probably going to be a little bit better because maybe they can control themselves more. They have more ability to get, get some depth. But then the argument could also be, well, there's no load to have intent with. So I think it's hard to say this is wrong or right. It has to have context. So I'm a big fan of, hey, if it's not going to hurt them and it, it's, it's, it, it's in a relatively safe environment and it passes the eye test, which every coach has a different set of eyes. I get it. It's hard to, it's hard to like qualify that. But I think if you, if you have to have some leeway there, right? There's, uh, Lee Taft talks, a lot of, talks about it a lot. Give athletes some room to make mistakes in a safe environment. Give them some play. Give them an ability to figure things out like motor learning. Matt Rhea of the Saints talks about this a lot as well in a lot of his research. There needs to be a level of they need to figure things out in terms of movement, right? Like it's, it, they have to be able to develop some of those motor learning uh, abilities. And it doesn't just happen when you're like, no, no, ankle here, foot here, knee there. No one's going to get strong and powerful if we're always doing that. We have to appreciate there's a level of uh, a, a leash, if you will, and you have to also have context. Now, if Erica says, hey, look, I have a history of, of, a, of a right ACL and some uh, medial knee pain. It, it's, it's always ongoing. Okay, maybe I want to take a closer look at that. But if there's no injury history and no issues, like let it rip and let them have fun. Uh, within a very safe environment, but let them learn through doing that. Everyone who split squats, for example, a very common exercise, is not going to split squat the same every time. This is the old, the age old debate of like knees over toes. Do we do it? Do we not? Like it's been popularized by Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy. People have been doing knees over toes their entire life. You know, he's not famous. It's just popularized movement or a pattern. Think about when we're going to sprint. If I said, hey, Eric, are we going to race? Number one, you'd toast me. But number two, our knees are going to go over our toes at some point. So we need to appreciate like, hey, like the other thing too is if we know they're going to be in these aggressive, violent angles in sports at high speeds, shouldn't we try to prepare them for some of that ability at some point? Maybe not right out of the gate, but there needs to be a line of progression. And this is, this, this is, this is the onus is on the coach to, hey, what's your rationale? What's your intent? In my exercise program design class here at the college, as well as my mentorship, APU, we talk about going to logic court, right? I'm the judge. And okay, what is your exercise selection rationale? Why did you select that? Is it attached to their needs analysis? Is it attached to their training goals, their injury history, their performance, uh, like KPIs? Is it attached to their sport? If you can't attach it somewhere, you shouldn't have the exercise in the program. So I know I went on a little bit of a tangent there. I apologize, but I think it's, it's kind of this all-encompassing approach when you, to answer that question. That's a really interesting answer. And now that I think about it, it's like you go on the street and you see people jogging or sprinting and everyone has knee valgus. Everyone has knees over toes. So there's like no like perfect movement. But mm -hmm. like you said, we try to build strength qualities, especially eccentric strength, the, the best we can mm -hmm. and just make our athletes as robust as possible for those less than ideal positions or chaotic uh, circumstances. So I, yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. Now let's move on to the chaotic aspect because uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm training agility, but every drill they're doing is really rehearsed and the athlete always knows where they're going. There's like zigzag cone set up and it's just super monotonous, but like, mm -hmm. why do we need to add that chaotic component to reach true agility? Yeah, so there's there's a, a chapter um, in a textbook that I'm using for my class right now that I probably should remember the name of. Paul Comfort is one of the authors. It's assessment and uh, prescription in uh, S&C, something along those lines. I think it's from 2018. One of the chapters is Agility Change Direction. And uh, this professor's name, she's from out in Australia. I believe it's at it's, uh, Edith Cohen University uh, in, in Perth, Australia, maybe. and it's uh, I, think, I probably should remember these names, Erica, right? Uh, Nicodemus is her last name, I believe. And she talks about this topic of maneuverability, right? So it's connecting the dots of change of direction, agility, reactionary components, external stimuli. So I think there's this level of we have to have a progression line 
to give the athlete the ability to understand changes in direction while appreciating motor learning theories, right? So do you mind if I share for a moment? Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So there's, everyone knows who Steph Curry is. This is a very easy um, thing to look at. So when we look at, seconds. Da, 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 da. okay. Oh, no, no, apologies. Got ahead of myself. So when we look at motor learning theory, I like Steph Curry as, as a very simple example because everyone knows how amazing he is and everyone remembers how he can shoot the ball now in today's day and age and not look at the hoop, which to me is like uh, unreal, right? So apologies for taking this. As a, this is taking a moment, but essentially I think we have to really appreciate motor learning theory and how an athlete approaches a drill, a pro, how they approach uh, agility drill or change direction drill, right? So da, 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 da. We're getting there, I promise. Okay, here we go. Perfect. All right, so motor learning theory, right? There are three stages of motor learning theory. Okay. So first stage, cognitive stage. Second stage, associative stage. Third stage, autonomous stage. The simple way to look at these, Eric, is what to do, how to do, and then just doing it, right? So there's Steph Curry right here. Sweet pair of J's right there. I believe those are the, the I don't know, not, sevens, eights. Right. He's probably in middle school. He, he, he's learning what to do at this age. He's not memorizing things. Yep. His father played in the NBA for the Raptors, Del Curry. So he probably had some genetics, but he's learning what to do. That's stage one. Number two is he's at Davidson. This is when this was his coming out party when he you know became uh, NBA ready. Now he's learning how to do it. His form has, has, has taken on a, a new ability. He's learning. He's, he's learning how to shoot the ball. His skill is improving. This last stage. He's just doing it. He ain't even thinking. Like, the ball's not in the hoop yet. The buzzer's gone off. He's looking the other way. I hate this picture because this is when the Celtics, my home team, lost to them up to nothing. But I'm going to cry about that later. But essentially, I think we need to appreciate all that. Right? There's stages to learning that can lend credence to, uh, you know, how an athlete can take on a drill, take on a, a, a new skill, like motor skill acquisition. So for me, I think as coaches – Give them something where they can display their awesomeness and challenge them, but challenge them a little bit over time. It's the same thing as baking, right? Don't to, don't add too much water too soon because then you're kind of screwed. Add a little bit of water over time, a little bit of water at a time, meaning you can add layers of difficulty in over time. Have them achieve a certain level. Okay, great. Erica, you're next for the next level. Okay, great. Erica, you did great. You're next for the ne you're, you're ready for the next level. I don't, I'm not a big fan of of forcing too much on too soon. You want to appreciate the level of learning and the learning curve. That's for someone who's relatively new to training and or moderately new. Someone who's advanced, they might go back to the basics every now and so often, but for the most part, they need a higher level of stimuli to make adaptations. We know is when someone's such a high level of an athlete, physiological adaptation is much more challenging because they're so great at what they do that like there's only so much left to, for, for adaptation to occur. Now, what age would you say there should be a formal controlled deceleration program in place? We we had so when I was co-owning a, a, a training facility nearby S and C, we had athletes come in who were as young as six seven years old. We had athletes come in who were ten eleven and couldn't train with us, right? So I think there's a, a level of maturity, not phys not physiologically, but mentally, cognitively. Hey, you know, we would tell parents, parents would say, this is a great question. Parents would say, hey, like, when is my son or daughter ready to train? Well, there's no, I, I don't, I don't ascribe to a very specific age, but it's, hey, if your six or seven year old daughter or son is going to take this seriously and treat it like a routine and do the work and show up on time and be responsible, be accountable and enjoy it, then they could train. They could be six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Like to me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I remember we had a 14 year old who just, treated it like it was recess. And I'm like, that's, this isn't going to fly. Like this is, he's not taking it serious. He's not, he's not putting the work in. It just didn't work out. So like I said, I've had someone as early as six be ready. I've had someone who at 14, not ready. So it, I find it challenging to give a really specific answer to that. What I will say is we need to appreciate growth spur and maturation physiologically. So from a loading standpoint, like running, sprinting, jumping, cutting, I think that's it's body weight. And although it's higher velocities, we can do that, like isos, eccentrics. 
when it comes to external low, like adding resistance, I think we need to be really mindful that someone's still growing. Bone mineral density probably isn't, isn't, isn't fully formed yet. Tendons and ligaments aren't fully formed yet. Muscles are still growing. So we need to appreciate that uh, less is more when they're younger. So younger, I'll use ages six to, six to 12. Less is more once they're past 12 and or in middle school. I think we can kind of uptick things a bit when they're in high school, like throw them off a wall to probably land. So what are some of your favorite deceleration and agility exercises? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a ton of videos in the in the slides, but I don't want to go back and forth. I should be able to talk off the top of my head. So when it comes to decel, like we talked about earlier, I'm going to master sagittal plane and frontal plane, bilateral to sort of or pseudo unilateral to unilateral, kind of what we alluded to earlier. I'm going to go body weight through those. I'm going to add resistance through a variety of forms. I'm going to start easy with a stick. Then I can go to some propulsive formats to where maybe you have a quick jab. So like a reactive component. So maybe you do a drop squat the stick and then you jump out. So then now we're kind of connecting the dots in, in multiple planes. Eventually get to some transverse plane rotational components. And then I think this is where we can loop in the whole kinetic chain. Like think of Mike Tyson throwing the punch. Think of uh, uh, Bo Jackson swinging a bat baseball bat. Right, this rotational component, it's through the entire kinetic chain. So then you then you can start thinking, okay, we're gonna do some medicine ball drills off the walls, like tosses, scoops, slams, adding some sort of rotation and or multi multi-directional um, abilities. Now we're connecting the dots. Most people think about D cell through the lower body only. Sure, you can start there, but it needs to go off the chain. So I have some videos in the slides where it shows, you know. Tyson throwing a punch, Serena Williams swinging a racket, like high velocity, high power, high speed strength type of rotational abilities in sport. We have to advance, advance to those eventually. You can do stuff with uh, bands and or medicine ball upper body, like a quick rotational punch, horizontal presses off the wall, stuff like that. When it comes to change of direction and agility, I start very, very simple. So you have a, you have a five or 10 yard lot, cone to cone, cone A to cone B. It's, it call, it, call it 10 yards. Start, start by just doing a sprint to stop. This is rehearsed. Erica knows exactly what she's doing. Then it's going to be a sprint to, once you get to the B cone, veer off into the, a 45-degree angle or a Y sprint. So it's sprint to A to B and then 45. Then it's a hard 90-degree turn. A to B, 10 yards, sprint, and then a hard 90-degree turn, 5, 10 yards, and you're done. That could be like a very simple, rudimentary change of direction. Then you can play around with like lateral shuffle to sprint, backpedal to sprint, like cone to cone change of direction, rehearsed. Agility, when I like to have some sort of partner. So you can do partner chases, partner taps. You can do contact, non-contact, verbal, non-verbal. You can use colors, numbers, anything where someone has to react to something, throw a ball, throw a tennis ball. Like there's, I mean, there's a variety of drills, but I, I like to start in that small kind of five, 10 yard spot. Keep it nice and easy. You can advance to like mirror drills. I know like ACL, return to play, like, Hey, mirror my movements. Um, you could do tag. Um, often at seminars or workshop, I, I set up like a, like a 10 yard by 10 yard square and I'll pick two people. Hey, go in there and play tag. And you can only use your right hand. You can only use your left hand. You can only use your right foot. Only use your left foot. Um, you know, if someone calls it a number, you can tag them. If they call it a color, you can't. Like just things where it makes people think. I'll also do um, partner chases. You got to be safe with these. So like leave a little bit of space between them. Um, you know, let's say we're sprinting and you're behind me, like maybe a yard. And if you tap my right hip, I have to sprint right, left, hip, left, so on and so forth. Or if I yell at a number, or yell at a color, just little games like that to gamify the experience. I think it's really beneficial and helpful. Then you can get much more advanced and get into like more of the athletic population or more like in-game situational type stuff. I think that, but that could take place in practice and in the game. So how much is too much, right? Think of load management and like making sure you're not overlapping too, too much with the actual sport itself. Those are really great drills. And I think it also gives everyone an idea of how much of a thought process is behind these progressions, which is why if you want to build deceleration and agility, you probably should see a performance coach because they'll have your best interest in mind in terms of where you start and how quickly you progress and what's appropriate for, for your goals and, and your needs and your injury history. So thanks for sharing that. And 
thank you for this discussion. I learned a lot myself. I'm pretty sure everyone listening did as well. And I know you're on Instagram. I will include your page in the caption below. Is there any other way people can reach out to you? Yeah. Instagram, honestly, is the easiest one. I'm, I'm on there literally all the time. Um, so just Matthew Ivram underscore. Someone else has my last name. Darn it. Um, but yeah, I, I interact a lot on, on Instagram. And then just a quick little shameless plug. My next upcoming full day deceleration workshop event is going down in New York City on November 11th. Early bird price is still alive. The it, We have 0.8 NSCA CEUs approved. I know NSCA CEUs that's coming up at the end of this year. So if anyone wants to just grab that, that's again, hit me up on Instagram, but that's the best place to contact me. I'm on there pretty much all the time. And so I really appreciate you having me on, Erica. This has been a blast. Thanks, Matt. This was a pleasure.